Hey y'all, Coach Nifai here, talking about the sabbatical year. Now, we got a question from one of our long-term subscribers asking about the sabbatical year. This was prompted by two things. One is that we recently did a class talking about how Rosh Hashanah is not really biblical. Talking about how we were always told that the year begins in the fall. Well, turns out that's not actually the case. And you guys can go over and check out that video after you watch this one. But she's also talking about the book called The Keys of Enoch and how it was given in the year 1973, which is around the time of the Jubilee year, which very well could have been at the beginning of that half hour of silence, seeing as though we learned over in the Apocalypse of Abraham that an hour in these days would be equivalent to a hundred years. So a half hour would be about 50 years or 49 years if you consider the Jubilee cycle. But we did a class on that and I'll link to them at the end of this video, Lord willing. But in this class, I want to talk specifically about the sabbatical year. And what I plan to do is answer the questions. Uh, what is the sabbatical year? When is the sabbatical year? Um, we'll touch a little bit on the Jubilee year and the importance of this 120th Jubilee cycle that we're in now. And by doing so, we'll get into many of the scriptures that talk about the sabbatical year as well as the Jubilee year. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. The first thing that we'll note is that it's not really called the sabbatical year in the Bible. If you want to find it in the scripture, you have to look for and put it in quotation marks, you'll find about 19 hits for the seventh year. Not all of them will be pertinent, but we'll hit on the highlights as we go. Now, the first place we see the seventh year mentioned is in Exodus chapter 23, verses 10 through 11, which says that six years thou shalt sow thy land and shalt gather in the fruit thereof, but the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat, and what they leave the beast of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. So the importance of this verse is that it is actually within the covenant. This is the covenant given to Moses. This covenant was the only time in human history that two million people got to hear the voice of our Heavenly Father, hallowed be his name, at one time. Um, they were out there at the base of Mount Sinai when he came and he actually gave them the covenant, which started with the Ten Commandments back there in Exodus chapter 20. And this covenant is covered in four chapters, chapter 20, chapter 21, 22, chapter 23, and it all together ends there in chapter 24, verse 7, when they wrap it up and all of the people there commit to keeping this covenant. This is actually part of the contract that we made that we will be held accountable for here in these end times. In other words, if we break this covenant, we take our life into our own hands. Um, so we really need to pay particularly a close attention to the things that are found in these covenants. And so let's look closely at this one here talking about the sabbatical year or the seventh year. It says that we ought to plant our fields for six years. And, you know, many of us don't have fields, um, but I believe even our gardens count because what's happening here is that the land is getting a rest. You see there in verse 11 it says so that the land can rest and lie still and we're going to get into some of the curses um, of what happens if you don't do this so we need to pay particularly close attention to this like i said um, um we could be getting ourselves in trouble if we don't pay attention to this uh year that the land is required to rest it's kind of like us on our sabbath day if we don't uh, let our bodies rest one day in a week um, then, you know, we, we do damage to our body. We don't get the health and recovery that we need in order to go forth. Well, the land is the same way. It has to have a rest period too, but it rests for an entire year. But now notice here that it says that the poor of thy land may eat 
and what they leave the beast of the field shall eat so not only are we not planting in this year we're also not even harvesting in this year even allowing others to come in and harvest on our land people that uh, don't have food are allowed to come onto our land and to uh, get the food that they need during this time you can imagine that there will be those who will be caught off guard or those who will don't who don't have food anyway during these hard times um, will be benefited when they can come and go out there and look at what the land is producing of its own. And then it goes on to talk about the vineyards and the olive yards. So the grape vines and the olive trees, the oil trees, will still be producing during that time. But we are not allowed to harvest of those trees. Um, it may be even beneficial to call in others and allow them to harvest this oil and to harvest these grapes so they can make their wine um, may benefit our land by blessing them. Verse 12 says, Six days thou shalt do thy work, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest, that thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. So this is talking about the Sabbath day. Um, and you can see that it is very similar to the sabbatical year. Um, in the Sabbath day, we're letting our animals um, rest. We're allowing our servants to rest, um, our children and our everybody gets to rest during the uh, Sabbath day while the land and everything gets to rest during the sabbatical year. Now, the next time we hear about the seventh year is in Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 4. You see, it starts off the same way. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath of the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. Now, this is getting specific because earlier in the week when I was thinking about doing this class, I was questioning, you know, whether we're allowed to cut the grass or not. Um, it's not mentioned here. Um, so I don't know. What do y'all think? Let me know in the comment section. But before you do, let me remind you um, of my testimony back when we came onto the Hillbilly Homestead and our lawnmower quit on us. Um, we had to go without a lawnmower for at least a year and we were surprised how many herbs grew up in what we thought was just grass and weeds turned out to be beneficial plants um, which actually led to my wife's herbal ministry because she discovered about 50 different um, plants and herbs that were good for health during that season so this what you know very well could come out of this you know when we let the land do its own thing it could actually surprise us in what it produces of its own Verse 5 says, That which grows of its own accord of the harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is the year of rest unto the land. So now he's repeating this because it's really so important for us to get this, that we're not to plant in this year and we're not to harvest in this year. We have to let it, um, let the animals eat it or let the poor people eat it, let the neighbors eat it, but we are not really allowed to even harvest it or we will break the land's rest period. And you can imagine how if this were not written like this, people would take advantage of it. When we get into the timing of the sabbatical year and you know what we were talking about, that whole Rosh Hashanah and the year starting in the spring instead of the fall, you can imagine there would be people who would go ahead and plant wheat or barley or whatever in the fall, knowing that when the spring rolled around, we wouldn't be able to plant anything, but they would still have all of that grain and stuff growing out there in the field. And so they would spend even that time during the sabbatical year actually out there harvesting what they had planted you know six months earlier thinking that they were okay because they hadn't violated anything but when it makes it clear that we're not supposed to harvest well that kind of puts a halt to all of that you know you're, you're not going to be out there taking advantage of the timing of the the, the year 
Now, the next time we'll see the phrase sabbatical year is down there in verse 20 out of Leviticus chapter 25. So let's skim through some of these other verses to make sure we're not missing anything important here. Like right there in verse 6 where it says, And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee, and for thy servants, and for thy maid, and thy for the hired servant and for the stranger that sojourneth with thee. So this is like the Sabbath day where everybody has to partake. You can't, you know, say that you're on your sabbatical year and then have, you know, some of these other people like your hired servants out there doing your work for you. That would be equivalent to having your servant to cook for you on the Sabbath day, knowing that you can't cook for yourself. Well, he's being very specific so that, you know, nobody tries to circumvent the rules or get away with, you know, something during this year. Verse seven says, and for thy cattle and for the beasts that are in thy land shall all the increase thereof be for meat. So this is going to be beneficial even to the cattle and the beasts because there we're not supposed to uh, have them to be out there working the land either. But they are the cattle are allowed to go out there and feed on the land. Um, unlike us. But now let's come over and let's look at it in the um, New International Translation um, because it seems to say a little bit different here and it could be a little bit confusing as part of the reason why we do these classes. Um, these I'm actually learning from these Bible studies too, if you can't tell. But anyway, when we look at verse 6 in the New International Version, it says, whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, for your males and female servants and the hired worker and the temporary resident who lives among you. So now to me, that seems like a contradiction. Let me pull them up side by side here. OK, so there they are side by side. And it doesn't look like a direct contradiction in verse six. But so let's go back and look at the other previous verses which said that we were not supposed to harvest of the land. All right, so looking back at verse five out of the New International Version, um, y'all guys, you guys help me understand this down in the comment section, but you see how it says, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. So it's saying here, do not harvest that which is growing on its own but then you look in the very next verse it says whatever the land yields during the sabbath year will be food for you so could this mean that whatever it grows during the sabbath year will be food for you in the next year because you can't harvest it in the next year um just the first thing that comes to my mind is maybe nuts or something that could last that long where it's actually producing the nuts during the sabbatical year. But then when the new year starts, you can actually go out there and get that food or something like that. Um, it's, it's a little bit tricky here. Let me let me check one more place before we move on. And that's going to be over here in the Septuagint translation of the Bible anytime I get into um, these wording issues. I always like to check with the Septuagint, which is a much better uh, translation of the Old Testament. And I say that because this scripture was actually available for uh, the disciples to refer back to as it was created 300 years before the Messiah came down. But anyway, Verse five in the Septuagint says, and thou shalt not gather the spontaneous produce of thy field and thou shalt not gather fully the grapes of thy dedication. It shall be a year of rest to the land. And then verse six says, and the Sabbaths of the land shall be food for thee and for thy manservant and for thy maidservant and the hireling and the stranger that abides with thee and for thy cattle and for the wild beasts that are in the land shall every fruit of it be for food. Now, I'm not sure if that straightened anything out. So 
Again, you guys help me out down in the comment section. I think I'm going to have to go on. And that should stand as a reminder to you guys, you know, these are Bible studies. Um, it's almost like we're at the table all studying together, except we're not. You know, we have to kind of communicate with each other down in the comments section instead of face to face. But I am a student just like you guys. Um, like I said, I am learning from these videos just like you are, hopefully. So don't think that I know everything. A lot of my videos, you'll find that I have more questions than I do answers. But anyway, let's go on. Now, down there in verse 8, it starts talking about the Jubilee year. So let's read it. It says, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Now, here is your Jubilee cycle. There's many people who are confused on this. Anytime you hear somebody say that a Jubilee cycle is 50 years or when they're counting one Jubilee year to the next Jubilee, they count 50 years. You know that they don't really understand Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 8, which says that a Jubilee cycle is seven times seven. That, that number is extremely important in all of the timing of everything. Um, we did a class not too long ago where we were talking about the moon and the sun, which are both on a seven day cycle. A day on the moon and a day on the sun are both 28 days long, seven times four. Um, it would be so on the earth as well, except for the earth's relative position to the sun makes it seem like we have an extra day in there. But anyway... You guys check out that video on the calendar. We're going to go on with this study with the understanding that a Jubilee cycle is only 49 years and not 50. Um, you see it talked about the 50th year here. That's the Jubilee year. But you understand that the 50th year falls in the first year of the next Jubilee cycle. The first year is the same year as the Jubilee year or the 50th year. But anyway, verse 9 says, Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So this is one of the things that we do in the Jubilee year that we don't necessarily do in the sabbatical year. Now, many of us, myself included, um, understanding that the scripture says that we will not recognize when the Jubilee year is until we get to the end times, we'll oftentimes blow the trumpet every year doing atonement um, just so we don't miss this Jubilee year. But we're getting closer to the understanding of when this is. Um, so we just need to keep in mind that this is one of the things that we do during the Jubilee year is we actually blow the trumpet during atonement. Now, this also gets, you know, into uh, some very important points when you think about how back during the time of Joshua, when he took command of the children of Israel, that was also during a Jubilee year. Um, and he blew the trumpet in the second month and when the walls of Jericho fell. So you think about that uh, back there during that time, he, again, he blew the trumpet. And we find that in the book of Jasher, I believe, chapter 88, that he blew the trumpet in the sabbatical year, causing the walls to, of Jericho to fall. But the thing about it, he blew them in the second month. Now, I think that's important here because here we ought to blow the trumpets not in the second month but on atonement day in the year of jubilee so could that mean that the walls of jericho will fall this time during atonement day during the jubilee year hmm i guess we'll find out it's not the walls of jericho anymore either it's the walls of babylon and being that atonement day is the next unfulfilled feast yeah this could be very important stuff but let's go on I believe we have a little time to get all of that straightened out. So let's look at verse 10. It says, And ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land 
unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Now, one thing that popped to mind here is the purpose of the jubilee year. Uh, when we did that class on the, um, the calendar, what we learned in that class is that the jubilee year is actually a calibration year. See, our time is actually based on the lunar cycle not the solar cycle like we've always been taught the the sun has its position and our timing to tell us when the days are when the days start when the sabbath days start and such like that but you have to remember that genesis chapter 1 and verse 14 tells us that the father's sacred calendar is based on three elements not just the sun alone but it's based on the moon as well as the stars all three have to line up in order to tell us where we're at in our sacred year well the thing about it the moon itself like we learned in the book of Enoch is the regulator it's what sets the time so what happens is is as the Sun has gone through 50 years the moon which is on a faster cycle has already completed those 50 years a year ago let me let me see if I can say that differently when the moon has completed its 50th year, the sun is still on its 49th year. So in order to make the two line up, in order to create a calibration to make the two line up, we have the 49th year, which puts us back on the lunar cycle. Now, I, I know I still didn't say that. Well, you guys may have to go back and check out that video on the calendar to get some clarity on that. So let's jump back into this verse here. It says, during this 50th year, we are to proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof. Um, and I have to point something out too, guys, um, based on observation and based on my own testimony when it comes to who are being affected by these Jubilee years um, and sabbatical years is actually the children of Israel, those who fall under that identification are the ones who are subject to all of this that's going on. In other words, if you look out in secular history during the Jubilee cycles or during the sabbatical years or Jubilee years and try to find things like um, economy collapsing or land changing hands, you're not going to see that unless you look specifically at the children of Israel. So back here in verse 10, where it's talking about proclaiming liberty, um, we're going to see that this is related to the land and how land is supposed to change hands during that year. Um, it says, It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. So this, you know, because of how they did it back in the ancient times and the way they're going to do it in the future, the land that belongs to our father, especially that which belongs to the Levites, is never really supposed to be sold. Um, you can lease it out. And that's what it's talking about here. You would only lease your land out until the Jubilee year, because during the Jubilee year, you're supposed to get that land back. And same thing, it goes for uh, when you hire yourself out. And then the sabbatical years and in the, in the jubilee years, you're supposed to actually get your freedom back and go back to work in your land. So this is important when we think about the next jubilee year when, you know, our father's people is supposed to leave modern day Egypt or Babylon with a high hand or with a lot of possessions. Well, this is the time we can expect all of that to take place is during the jubilee year when all of this, all of these transactions go down one way or the other in other words that's the year when we can expect to get our stuff back verse 11 says a jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you ye shall not sow neither reap that which groweth of itself in it nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed so here it is again telling us that in the jubilee year that we're not supposed to plant 
or to harvest. So we think about this here. Um, you know, there's so many people who reject the book of Enoch, which is the authority on the calendar. I'll say that again. If you want to know how the calendar works, the sacred calendar, that is, you have to go to the books of Enoch. There's no other scripture that tells you how the sacred calendar works. Um, as simple as that. And to circumvent that scripture, uh, the people who reject that, that text and don't want to go by what the book says actually go by the barley harvest in order to try to uh, predict the year which is kind of backwards when you think about it because the priests are supposed to tell the farmers when the plant but you know these people are backwards when they think about the, the barley harvest because now you have the farmers telling the priests when it is that they're supposed to keep their feast days and you know that that don't really make sense. The farmers are business people. So we're putting business people in charge of our feasting and when our feast days are to occur. That That's never was supposed to be the case. And for further proof that the barley is not supposed to be how we determine the feast year, we can use these verses here, which says that we're not supposed to plant barley or harvest barley for two years straight. So those who will be trying to obey the sabbatical year, however, are confused about the significance of the barley year will have two years when they don't have a way of telling what season we're in both the sabbatical year followed by the jubilee year they're not supposed to plant and they're not supposed to harvest barley at all barley is not supposed to be seen anywhere in the uh among the children of Israel, except maybe in their storehouses that they've been storing for almost three years now so all that to say that we need to stop paying attention to people who are trying to circumvent the scripture by talking about a barley harvest. That ain't real. The barley harvest is not real when it comes to the sacred calendar. Again, the, it is not the farmer's responsibility to tell us when our feast days are. That is the number one responsibility of the priest and the Levites uh, other than healing us is to actually tell us what season we're in they they are the ones out there looking at the new moons and blowing the trumpets telling us when our when our uh, when when our month starts and when our Sabbath day starts they're not out there calling up the farmers and asking them what day it is that's laughable but anyway, let's go on. Verse 12 says, For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. So here, here it is again, like we were back with the sabbatical year. Now it seems to be saying, Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. So let's go back to uh, the Brenton Septuagint and see what verse 12 says. It says, for it is a jubilee of release. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat its fruit off the land. Hmm. So now by fruit, is it talking about the holy part? Because if it's not, if it's talking about the nuts and the berries, then that seems to be in conflict somehow. Um, so if you haven't done so already, um, let us know your opinion down in the comment section and let's collaborate down there to see if we can get an understanding of this because nobody wants to be in error. You know, nobody wants to be out there harvesting nuts or, or something off this land with the chance that we could actually be getting in trouble, you know, because, you know, the curses associated with not keeping these sabbatical years are severe. You, one of the things is you actually end up losing the land altogether. So we really need to get this right. Now, verse 13 says, In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. So, like I said, we're looking forward to this time because the children of Israel, not the whole world, this doesn't go on for the Gentiles of the world. Those who are not keeping the feast days or the laws can't expect to get anything back. In fact, they are the ones who expected to lose that what they have that is of ours they're going to lose it as it's returned back to us during this year every man 
unto his possession. This is the year when we will get our land back. Verse 14 says, And if thou shalt sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buy us aught of thy neighbor's land, ye shall not oppress one another. So if you've bought the land of one of these Levitical priests or this land that belongs to our father, you could actually lose possession of it during this time. So, you know, like I said, it's important for us to get this right. Verse 15 says, according to the number of years after the Jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor and according unto the number of years of the fruits he shall sell unto thee. So what this is referring to is how you count the years. When we, when we are to do land deals biblically, again, we're not supposed to sell the land flat out. You're actually supposed to lease it out. And you only lease it until the next Jubilee year. So if it is our understanding that the Jubilee year were to start in the spring of 2024 well then we can only lease out the land for that amount of time you don't but then after the year 2024 um and we wanted to lease our land we would get a much bigger profit out of it because there will be many more years involved i hope that makes sense again this is actually supposed to come to a realization in other words we all supposed to really get this after the day of the lord event when you know everything goes back to the way it's supposed to be this land transaction and jubilee years will all be straightened out then anyway so let's go on that's again what verse 16 is saying according to the multitude of years thou shalt increase the price thereof and according to the fewness of years thou shalt diminish the price of it for according to the number of the years of the fruit does he sell unto thee so again it's just leasing out the property not selling it 17 says ye shall not therefore oppress one another but thou shalt fear thy god for i am the lord your God. So we have to take this into account in order to do these transactions biblically. Verse 18 says, Wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. And so understanding how our Elohim work, we can be a, we can rest assured that if we don't do this correctly, then we're not going to dwell in the land in safety. So again, this is important that we get this right. Verse 19 says, And the land shall yield their fruit, and ye shall eat your fill, and dwell therein in safety. So this is one of the blessings and the curses associated with doing this right, is that we will get a good bounty for harvest when we allow the land to get its rest. And if we don't allow the land to get its rest, well then we end up cursing that land. And that may be why we are Required almost to use a whole bunch of artificial fertilizers on the land, which is actually killing the land, um, by the way, um, in order to get stuff to grow. Because stuff, you know, which normally would use natural fertilizers in order to grow, um, just ain't there anymore. And it's probably because, you know, we're not allowing the land to rest. Um, kind of reminds you of, you know, our bodies when we don't get it the proper rest that it needs then we have to use drugs and other stuff in order to uh, keep us going sometimes but let's go on verse 20 gets back into the sabbatical year and it says and if ye shall say what shall we eat the seventh year behold we shall not sow nor gather in our increase then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. So here it is, you know, and we're getting ready for the sabbatical year. And you can imagine there's many farmers out there watching this video going, hey, how, how are we supposed to eat? You know, if we're not going to be planting um, and how are we supposed to eat during this time? Are we going to be expected to go into Babylon and get food? Well, you see here, know that he already has it set up to where you would get a bountiful harvest in the sixth year. So in the sixth year, you will get enough food for uh, three years. And 
you know, for those who are not farmers, whatever it is, however it is, you receive your fruit would actually, you know, fall under this. I've learned from my own personal experience um, back during the last sabbatical year. You know, I wasn't a farmer or a rancher or anything as far as agricultural or husbandry was concerned. I was basically making money down there in the corporate offices, but during or well, right before that sabbatical year is when I got several windfalls that was able to carry me and my family over for the three years, just like it, it says there. Only thing about it, I didn't have a video to look at like this one that explained that to me. So I wasn't really prepared to make that money stretch like it was supposed to. So, you know, we thank the Lord for the understanding that we're getting now. But anyway, verse 25 says, And ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits come in, ye shall eat of the old store. So in the sixth year, you get the bountiful harvest. Then in the seventh year, you're not supposed to plant anything or harvest anything, but you still have the fruit from the sixth year. And even in the eighth year, which you are just now starting to plant, you still don't have anything to harvest, but you still have food yet from the sixth year carrying you all the way until the ninth year when that what you planted in the eighth year is ready to harvest, if that makes sense. The scripture actually may have been a little more clear on that. So let's go on. It says the land shall not be sold forever for the land is mine. For ye are strangers and sojourners with me. So this is what we we're talking about earlier, about how the land is supposed to be leased out, not sold. And then verse 24 is talking about how we are to grant a redemption for the land. In other words, there comes a time during these jubilee years that we're actually supposed to give the land back. And the subsequent verses actually gets into more detail on that. And how all that works. So you guys go ahead and finish out that chapter on your own. I want to get into Deuteronomy chapter 15, which gives us some more information on the sabbatical years. Verse 1 says, At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. It says, And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. In other words, this is the year in which all of the children of Israel now are to have all of their debts forgiven. And man gives us provisions for this by allowing us to file for bankruptcy for those who want to go the legal route and actually just to walk away from the credit market for those who uh, want to go the biblical route. They, they can just simply walk away. There may be some other repercussions behind doing it that way, but that is a common practice, believe it or not, that there are people who just walk away from their debts. You know, again, they may have to leave their car or their house behind, but they end up being debt free. And a lot of people will take advantage of this during this year of release, whether they know about it or not. Many people will lose their jobs and something like that. And so that's why it's, it's important to stay prayed up and to um, realize that our father is... Um, in charge to have that fortitude to know that he is responsible for our well-being so that when some of these life changes happen we don't give credit to the evil one saying you know that the devil took my job away because it could actually be our father who was making a way for us to get this release but now look at verse 3 it says of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again but that which is thine with thy brother thine hand shall release. So as far as the Gentiles are concerned, they would be the foreigners. So if, you know, the foreigners, if the Gentiles, if you have um, debts that are owed to you from the Gentiles, you know, you could make them pay up. But as far as the children of Israel, um, you're supposed to actually release that debt. And if you have their possessions, uh, you're actually supposed to give them back to them. Verse four says, 
Save when there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. So now here, if you're dealing with a bunch of wealthy people, you know, and they milk making big business transactions, then this may not be the case. But you're not going to have a whole lot of that going on with our father's people. Um, of course, there's two different kinds of our when it comes to the finances of our father's people you have the have and you have the have nots which have to work together for us all to get this done but there will come a time where there will be no more have nots again when this these transactions take place for this final time in this final jubilee um there will be no more poor people among us and then we don't have to worry about this kind of thing anymore but now the rest of the chapter goes into more greater detail on this, like uh, particularly verse nine down there, um, which, you know, describes some of this in great detail. So you guys go off and um, read, you know, the end of that chapter. Maybe you're taking notes and you're writing down these chapters that you'll read after this video is over. The main thing we're understanding there is that the seventh year is the year of release. And, you know, it kind of reminds us, you know, how, you know, we hear a lot about the great reset, you know, the, 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 the secular um, business people are talking about a great reset. That great reset could actually correspond with so many people becoming the children of Israel by keeping the feast days and obeying the commandments these days that the world could actually feel uh, the net result of so many people going through this so-called release that they're calling it a reset but anyway let's come over here and let's look at leviticus chapter 26 and verse 34 which is all about the curses well we see there in verse 34 that is talking about the land and its sabbaths let me read it it says then shall the land enjoy her sabbaths as long as it lieth desolate and ye be in your enemy's land even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. So now this I understand to be the curse if we are not to uh, mine the Sabbath. You know, and I often talk about, you know, this area that I live here in uh, the southeastern United States, which is full of just vacant land. There's hardly anybody around. Uh, and you see this in rural areas all over the country where there's very, very few people who are there working the land. The land is kind of just growing up on its own. Well, you see why here is because when the previous landowners were there, they did not mind the, sab the sabbatical years. And so them and their children when suffering hunger because the land won't produce anything was forced to back into the cities and then once they gone back into the cities like you read there in verse 33 then the land is able to enjoy the rest that it was supposed to get when the people was here so this is an important reason why we're supposed to be obeying the sabbath or the sabbatical years is because we want to keep our land we want we don't want to put our land at risk um, or put ourselves at risk of losing that land by not minding the sabbatical years verse 35 says as long as it lieth desolate it shall rest because it did not rest in your sabbaths when ye dwelt upon it and this ain't a year for year thing you know you get one sabbatical year wrong and now you're going to end up in babylon no that that's not how it works it's a accumulation over so many sabbatical years and then next thing you know the land has to make up for all of those sabbatical years that you messed up you can actually do the math on this back when the children of israel spent those 70 years in babylon and you could do the math and figure out that they had forgotten the sabbatical years going back so many years and so what you end up with is 70 times seven years so you could imagine that they had forgotten the sabbatical years for about 490 years or so but anyway that brings me to the other thing that we wanted to talk about and that's when is the sabbatical year 
Now, it's important for us to allow the scripture to define itself. So we can't really go on opinions and, you know, what people think when it comes to the sabbatical year. That's, that's just not going to ever get it. People are never going to be on one accord unless we can find it in the scripture. So let's look at when the last known sabbatical years were in the scripture. And one way we can do that is getting some help from the web like for instance wikipedia's web page on the smith day year it has a lot of information on the sabbatical year but one thing that it does give us and we'll see this in another place is a few times that the sabbatical year is mentioned in the scripture like for instance over in the book of maccabees we can see that there was a sabbatical year in the year 162 bc and we can see that also repeated over in another web page called setapartpeople.com, which lists the last known sabbatical years. You see, they list 162 BC coming from 1 Maccabees chapter 6 in the book of uh, Josephus Antiquities 12. Talk about how there was a sabbatical year in 162 BC. And also looking at this document, we can see that there was a sabbatical year in the year 456 bc that's corresponding back when they got the decree to rebuild jerusalem and then there is another sabbatical year that we hear about in 134 bc that's in first maccabees chapter 16. so this here what we see in first maccabees could be the last known accounts of a sabbatical year but we could use these in order to understand when the next sabbatical year will be. And it's real easy to do. All we do is understand that there is a sabbatical year every seven years. And then we have to understand that there was no such thing as year zero. So we have to add a year. So when we look at 312 seven year cycles from the year 162 B.C., we see that the next sabbatical year starts in the spring of 2023. Now, in previous videos, you've seen me talk about the sabbatical year starting in the fall of 2022. And that's because I was under the impression that Rosh Hashanah was a real thing, thinking that that's when the harvest season started was in the fall. But turns out, that's another one of those Jewish fables and there's no such thing as a new year starting in the fall. The There is only one new year and that's in the spring. So that's when the sabbatical years will start in the spring, just like it did back there with Joshua and Jericho. Now, that was when we used 162 that we found out about in 1 Maccabees chapter 6. But when we look at 1 Maccabees chapter 16, we see that there was a sabbatical year in 134 BC. So let's do the same thing and see if we come up with the same year to be a sabbatical year. Okay, so now this time we will have to go 308 sabbatical year cycles but again we see that there is a sabbatical year to start in the year 2023 so with this information based on the scripture and simple mathematics that's important to understand we're not making up stuff here we're not talking about barley harvest and what people think and economies and markets and all of this all this other stuff we're using the scripture we're getting from the book of first maccabees and we're using math to come up with this next sabbatical year being 2023. Real simple. We can be assured that 2023 will be a sabbatical year. Just like the year 2016 was when I personally received a release of all of my financial obligations. But anyway, let's look to see when the next Jubilee year will be using the same method scripture and math now to find out when the last known jubilee year is or was we have to go back to the book called the book of jubilees this is a book all about the jubilees um this is found alongside the book of enoch 
in the hidden text, but you can rest assured that it is still inspired scripture. In fact, this book was actually written by Moses too, back when he was writing Genesis and Exodus. And this book is actually called Little Genesis, but the difference is, is that it actually gives us the timing of the events. Like for instance, how verse four tells us that when they crossed the river Jordan, it was during a Jubilee year. Let me just read it. It says, wherefore I have ordained for thee the year weeks and the years and the Jubilees. There are 49 Jubilees from the days of Adam unto this day and one week and two years. And there are yet 49 years to come for learning the commandments of the Lord until they pass over into the land of Canaan, crossing the Jordan to the west. And to understand when this date was, we can use the scripture by looking at the dates of the progenitors and the kings. What I mean is we can look at the dates in which our forefathers, Adam, Seth, Enos, Enoch, Methuselah, Jared, and all of those guys begat their sons. We could use those dates to find out exactly when this year was that they crossed the river Jordan. And what we find out is that this was during the year 1456 BC. That's the year in which they crossed the river Jordan. And that was the last known Jubilee year. So there we have the scripture. And so now all we have to do is add the math to it and we can see that the 120th Jubilee cycle started in 1974. That's the 120th Jubilee because we see that there was 50 Jubilees until we get to the crossing of the River Jordan. And then there are 70 Jubilees until we get to 1974. And that goes back to our commenters point and how the Keys of Enoch was given in 1973. January of 1973, this would hold to the pattern like how Moses came a year or two before the children were expected to leave Egypt. That's what it means when it says the spirit of Elijah will come before the events. But anyway, and, and this corresponds to that half hour of silence that she was speaking of. Because what we understand is that that half hour of silence started in 1974 and will last for a Jubilee cycle. But wait, now I've made a rookie mistake by living out that year one. We have to remember that year one or oh, it's going to throw us off by a year. There was no such thing as year zero. So that means that the 120th Jubilee cycle started in the year 1975. So now if we go one Jubilee cycle ahead, that means that the next Jubilee year will start in the spring of the year 2024, right around the time when we have the completion of that X across America. Like we said at the beginning of this video, it ties into what we read about over in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13, when these 400 years are supposed to be up and the children of Israel are supposed to leave with all of these possessions and this wealth. Well, this is actually supposed to go down during the Jubilee. So we can be assured that this will go down sometime around the year 2024. And like we learned over in the Bible study, it could very well go down during a time of atonement in the year 2024. But I would hold off at least until the Feast of Hanukkah during the year 2024, only because of what we read about over in books like Haggai and how it all corresponds to the Feast of Hanukkah lining up with Christmas. But we cover all of that in other videos. We just want to talk about the timing of the Jubilee year and what we can be sure uh, based on what we are learning here is that the next sabbatical year starts in the spring of 2023 
and the next Jubilee year starts in the spring of 2024. So we still yet have some time to work the land. I personally would like to get some more trees and stuff here to the Hillbilly Homestead and get them planted sometime before the spring starts, get them in the ground. Maybe I can get them in in the wintertime when it's good to plant fruit trees and stuff to get them off to a good start. Knowing that for the next few years, there will be no harvest of these trees. So then in the year 2025, the spring of 2025, we may even start to see some fruit from these trees that we had planted two years earlier. So I know this is a lot of information, but I hope you did get something out of it. And if you did, go ahead and hit the like button and let me know down in the comment section and I'll see you there. Shalom.